We are so glad you joined us today. God wants to do so much in you and through you, and we want to hear about it. Would you send us an email at amen at tawm.cc to tell us your story? You can also go online to give to this ministry by going to tawm.cc and clicking on the Give tab at the top of the screen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the message. Take out your Bibles today as we continue our message series entitled Heroic. Everybody shout heroic. Go with me to the book of Jonah chapter 1. For those of you who don't spend a lot of time in your Bible, you'll probably have to find a tab that says Jonah. If you really don't know what to do, if you got a Bible, just go to the front few pages of your Bible. There's something there called a table of contents. Uh, or you could do like me, just flip over to page 637. If you got, a, if you got an anointed Bible, it'll be on page 637. Amen. Y'all stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. If you got legs, we're going to honor God's Word in here. Praise the Lord. If you have the ability, please do that with us. As we get into the Word of God today, everybody look this way. I want your attention for a moment. We're getting ready to get into the holy, powerful Word of God that the Bible says is sharper than any two-edged sword that divides asunder between joints and marrow and between spirit and flesh and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. What that's telling us is when the Word of God goes forth, it holds power and weight, and it causes people to think about their life and think about what God's doing in their life. So what I'm going to ask you, Big Willie, is to find a seat. Amen. He comes in late every service. I told him next time he come in late, I'll go and get him. I got you. All right, you got Don't be coming in here like that no more. What are we going to do today is we preach the Word of God. If you go out of the building, I'm going to ask you not to come back in. Praise the Lord. That's the only way I know how to stop it. Because if, we, if you move, we want, to, we want to keep everybody's focus. So if you've got to go out, would you just ease up into the balcony, set up there or set against the back wall, just come in and not be distracting. Does that sound good to everybody? Let me tell you why. Because the Word of God is important. Amen? And you never know what that distraction might keep somebody from getting a major word from the Lord. Amen? So let's get into our Bibles this morning as we look and continue our series entitled Heroic. Last week I preached about Samson. If you didn't get nothing out of the Samson message, find another church. I can't help you. That's all I got. I'm telling you, that's as much revelation as I could give you. But if you weren't here, please go back and listen to that message. All right, Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to bounce around in a few verses here. Jonah verses uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We're going to start there. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mattai, Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Look at with me now, verse number 4, same chapter, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. One translation says he prepared a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest so that the ship was about to be broken up. Go with me to verse number 17 of chapter 1. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now go with me to chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4, verse number 7. Jonah chapter 4, verse number 7. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. Notice God's preparing a wind. God's preparing a fish. Now God is preparing a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. Hallelujah. Y'all ready to learn about Jonah? For you young adults in here tonight, we got a special worship. I almost forgot it. We forgot it. We've got a worship. What time does it start, brother? 6.30. Every young adult, get in here tonight and get a part of it. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us today. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now to come in this room with the powerful anointing upon me to teach the word of the Lord as the shepherd of this house, but also give us an anointing upon all of our ears to hear what the Spirit of God's got to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now, in every single one of these messages, I'm kind of 
just flowing out of the overflow of my heart. I, I don't have a whole lot of notes. I have a few things jotted down here and there, but I'm just kind of coming out of my inner man with this. You know, a lot of preachers preach, preachers preach from the bottom of their barrel. I believe, you know, my saucer uh, is, uh, my cup is full and it's running over and my saucer's got, I believe in preaching from excess. So I just, I've internalized these messages and I've got them in my heart. And so today I'm just going to talk to you. Let me give you a little bit of introduction about this prophet, what the Bible calls, or what theologians call a minor prophet, which is Jonah. Jonah is a very, very interesting book in that Jonah lived in a place called Gath Hefer. Gath Hefer is located in a little town or a little village that you would be familiar with called Nazareth. Nazareth. Everybody say Nazareth. Now you know Nazareth is a little bitty place. There was another popular person who came from Nazareth and that was a Nazarene by the name of Jesus. And so when you think about Jonah and where he lived, just think about this little town called Nazareth. Now that's important because in John chapter 5, I believe it is verse 52, the, the Pharisees claimed that there was never a prophet that had arisen out of Nazareth when they were talking about Jesus being a prophet. But that wasn't true. One of their own prophets, Jonah, was a prophet that arose out of Nazareth. Now the reason that the Pharisees probably did not give much attention to Jonah the prophet is because Jonah is the only prophet in the Old Testament who ministers completely to Gentiles and not called specifically to the Jewish people. So he's the only one going to Gentiles. So that's probably the reason there was said a never a great prophet came out of Nazareth. But yet Jonah arose out of Nazareth. Another interesting caveat about Jonah the prophet is that Jonah is the only prophet in all the Bible that Jesus is likened to. Jesus isn't likened to any other prophet other than Jonah the prophet. Now you're going to see, obviously, it's not because Jonah was such a cool dude and such a righteous dude. In fact, Jonah wasn't, was quite the opposite of that. So why in the world was Jesus likened unto Jonah as a prophet? Well, you remember Matthew chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and said, Hey, give us a sign that you're the Messiah. And Jesus said to them that, that the only sign that will be given to you is the sign of Jonah the prophet. What he was saying was, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. He's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He says this is a sign. It's interesting to me that God would use a man like Jonah to point to a greater man like Jesus and the redemptive work. Jonah's life was quite unredemptive in the way he lived, and you're going to see that in detail in a second, so that's really interesting. The other thing is Jonah has four chapters. These four chapters describe four places in every person's life that is in this room. In chapter 1, Jonah is running from God. In chapter 2, Jonah is running to God. In chapter 3, Jonah is running for God. And in chapter 4, Jonah is running ahead of God. Now, that, that pretty much sums up everybody in this room. There are some of you in this room that you're running from God. All right, I'm going to try this side. That's how we're going to be on Sunday morning. And then there are some of you in this room, you're, you've been running from God, and you're here today because you're trying to run to God, Right? I'm going to try the youth section over here. And then there's some over here in the youth section. You're on fire for God, and you're running for God. Yeah. That's stinking weak right there for a youth section. And then there's those of us in here that, you know what, we've been running with God for a while, and we just assume that we know God so much and what God's going to do. You know what we're doing? We're running ahead of God. But that's pretty much where everybody falls in life. So in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is running uh, from God. Jonah 2, Jonah is running to God. Jonah 3, Jonah is running for God. Jonah 4, Jonah is running ahead of God. Now there's another, one more interesting thing that we've got to look at as we get into these four chapters here today. And that is that there is the use of a word that is in all four chapters that is an unusual word, Brother Marty, and it is the word prepared. 
All right? So in Jonah chapter 1, we see God prepared a wind. Jonah 1.17, that's 1.4. One Jonah 1.17, we see God prepared a a great fish. Then we see that God in Jonah chapter 4, I think it is verse 8, God prepared a worm. Everybody say prepared. Now the word prepared there is interesting because it is the Hebrew word manna. Manna. Anybody ever heard of manna before? Manna was what God fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now, do you know why it's called manna? Because the Hebrew word manna literally means what is it? Right? What's that? Manna. What a, what, what is that? Right? Manna. What, are y'all here today? Are y'all awake this morning? What is it? Manna. That's what it is. So the Hebrew, the, the children of Israel literally would go out of their tents and God would rain down this manna and they would have to go out and pick it up every day. And when they would walk outside, they'd go, what's for supper? Right? What is it? What is it? Well, is it bread? Well, it's kind of like bread, but not like bread. What is it? Well, is it fish? I don't know. It tastes like fish. Kind of got a fishy taste. What is it? I don't know what it is. Even though we didn't know what it was or what they didn't know what it was, Jay, they knew it was the provision from God. Because the other meaning of the word manna means to provide or to be provision. Now, I just got to stop right here for a second and preach this if I can. How many times have you and I had things happen in our life that we would look up and say, what in the world is this? Why did I have that car wreck? Why did I slip down those stairs? Why did this happen to me and my family? Why did the job, did my, my boss cut my job? Why did I not get the raise? Why is my kids acting crazy? Why is my family under attack? Anybody ever had a bunch of whys in your life? Y'all better answer me. I'll preach all day long. Y'all better answer me. You ever had any whys? Now, it's important that you never write your book till the end of the story. Because when you have a bunch of whys and you write your book, you always are emphasizing the why. But how many of you have had a bunch of whys only to get to the other side of the story, to look back by faith over what God did in your life and say, hold it just a second. You know that moment that I didn't understand what was going on in my life? It was actually the provision and the plan of God. God was actually blessing me, helping me, taking care of me in the middle of my what is it. Right? Manna. So watch now. God prepares. Everybody say prepares. Manna prepares a wind, prepares a fish, prepares a worm. God is preparing in every single chapter. God is preparing. Now, Jonah is not writing his book as he's going along. The book of Jonah was written later after Jonah's story. I think Jonah, if he was writing the book while he was in the storm, he would be saying, why is this going on? What did I do to deserve this? Jonah, I don't even think, would see himself as running from God. Because I think Jonah does what all of us do, and I'm just trying to immerse myself in this story. I think we rationalize why we don't do what God's called us to do. I think we rationalize it. So if I was in the story, if I was Jonah in this moment in time, I would probably say something like this. Well, you know, I think I heard God speak to me, but there's nobody else that's going to Gentile people. God hasn't reached out to the Gentiles yet. Not only that, these are Assyrians who are, are like the enemy. So I'm not going to get in the bed with the enemy. I can't be hearing God. So you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll go the other direction because I must be crazy and losing my mind, and I can't be hearing God. He would justify his disobedience I'm going to say that again he would justify his disobedience right but on the other side of the story looking back in the moment you can see that obviously Jonah was disobeyed so with these four chapters where Jonah is running from God and then Jonah is running to God and Jen Jonah is running with God and then Jonah is running ahead of God and the fact that God in the midst of all of this running is preparing manna 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 provision even though Jonah don't know what it is it's provision even though Jonah don't understand it it's provision even though Jonah's afraid 
it's provision. Even though everybody's saying it's the devil going to kill him, it's provision. I'm so glad that the devil don't have near as much power as Christians say that he has. Right? In the midst of this, we come to chapter 1, and I see something. I see the Word. The Word. So if you're going to take notes, write it down. We're going to get four things to write down. The Word. The Word. The Word of the Lord. The Bible says, Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2, And the Word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. The Word of the Lord came and said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and prophesy against their wickedness. They've done great wicked things. The word of the Lord. In other words, God gives Jonah an assignment. Jonah is called by God to do something special. There's an assignment on, God, on Jonah's life. I see the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. And if I had time this morning, I'd talk about living your life according to the direction of the word of the Lord. But that's a, another message for another day. The word of the Lord gives Jonah an assignment. Here's the problem. The problem is the assignment is to go to Nineveh. Does anybody in here know where Nineveh is? Anybody ever been to Nineveh? Anybody ever said, hey, let's go on a vacation. Let's take a cruise to Nineveh? No. Do you know why you don't know where Nineveh is, but it's very important? Because Nineveh is modern-day Mosul, Iraq. It is the seedbed of terrorism. It was controlled by the Assyrians, and it was a great city. It was a Syria. It was terrorism. The seedbed of terrorism. So when the word of the Lord comes to you and says, go to the terrorist, go to where they're putting people in cages and drowning them or setting them on fire, go to where they're literally feeding them to the lions, go to where they're cutting off heads, how many know it makes it much easier to justify disobedience when it, when it not only doesn't make sense, but it's a place you really don't want to go at all. I wonder how many people God has told to do things, called to do things that seem to be difficult or even in our minds impossible, and we have justified why we can disobey and run from God. And so you know now that Nineveh is a great city and there's great wickedness in Nineveh. So God's raising up a prophet, Jonah. Now you would think God sent him a major prophet. Nope, God sends a minor prophet. A minor prophet to go speak into the wickedness of this city. Now Jonah says, um, I'm not going to pass, go, I'm not going to collect $200. I'm getting on a ship and getting out of Dodge. So the Bible says Jonah takes off running to a place called Joppa. For those of you who are going to go to Israel with me in March and April, we're going to go to Joppa. We'll stand you right there where Jonah caught that ship. And so Jonah is at a port called Joppa. He gets on a ship and he sails to Tarshish, right? Tarshish. Now that's actually southern Spain is where he's selling to. Now the wind and the storm hits as they're on their way to Tarshish. If you look at a map, and I almost put a map up for you today, but if you look at a map, watch this, from Joppa to Nineveh is 500 miles. From Joppa to Tarshish is 2,500 miles. Why do I bring that up? Because of this main point, I want you to look at the screen. It's very hard to disobey God. Did you know it's always harder to disobey God than it is to obey God? See, Jonah in his mind was justifying why it was too hard to obey God when in reality his disobedience required a lot, much, lot more energy, a lot more effort, and a lot more time out of his life than his obedience would have. When the word of the Lord comes to you, always remember that you have a choice to obey or disobey, but if you disobey, you have to work harder to disobey God. Did you know the scripture says in the book of Psalms, the way of a transgressor is hard? In other words, a person who knows to do right but doesn't do it, it's hard. The reason some of us, our life is so hard 
is because we are disobeying God. And disobeying God is always harder than obeying God. You say, but pastor, you don't know what he called me to. Listen, I don't care how difficult it, the thing is that he's called you to. I don't care. It, you might feel be called, be called to be an entrepreneur or be called to be a missionary. It doesn't matter how difficult it is, that he's, the thing that he's called you to. It is always more difficult to disobey God than it is to obey God. Somebody say amen right now. So the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Jonah works hard to disobey God, goes 2,500 miles out of his way to disobey God. But I'm so glad that whenever I'm faithless, God remains faithful. And sometimes when I don't want to do it and I get out of line of sorts or I get off track, aren't you glad that God will always prepare something to bring you back in line? So Jonah is running. Y'all going to have to help me. Can I preach on Jonah a little bit today? So Jonah is running. And by the way, if I could subtitle my message, I call him the legendary loser. He's legendary. Everybody talks about Jonah and the whale. Even VeggieTales has got something about Jonah and the whale. But Jonah is legendary, but he's a loser. La who is a her. Say it with me. La who the legendary loser. Watch this. As the legendary loser, God tells him to do something. He takes off running in the wrong direction, trying to disobey God. But notice the Bible says, and God prepares a wind. God prepares a wind. And it is a bad storm. So watch, we have the wind, now we have, or we have the word, now we have the wind. If God gives you a word and you go in the opposite direction, the next thing that's coming is a wind. See, we always say every storm is of the devil. No, there's four reasons for storms in your life. Four, four. Have you noticed I'm on four today? Come next week, it might be six or ten. Who knows? I'm on four today. There's four reasons for every storm. Can I give them to you? Number one, it's just life. Do you know just because you had a car wreck, it wasn't the devil? It could be the lady in front of you just stopped too quick and you didn't notice it. <laughs> right? Did you know just because you didn't make a good grade, on the ACT, it wasn't the devil. Could be you need to study a little more, and that's just life, right? Sometimes life happens. Jesus said, in this life, you're going to have trouble. How many know sometimes life just stinks, right? <laughs> sometimes you're the windshield. Sometimes you're the bug. Can I get a witness? This, this side over here is not too active this morning. Let me go to this side of spiritual. Can I get a witness that sometimes life is just hard? Don't look for a demon behind every bush. Sometimes life is just tough. Just what it is. Just suck it up and know Jesus said, in this life you're going to have trouble, but he said this next part too, but be of good cheer. In other words, don't let the trouble of life destroy your attitude about life. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You're going to come out on the victorious side. So sometimes storms are just life. Number two, sometimes storms are spiritual attacks. Sometimes demonic forces are behind the storms of life. You remember Mark chapter 8, I believe it is, Jesus stands up in the boat and rebukes the storm. It's the same word that he uses when he rebukes the demons out of a young boy. Sometimes the enemy can cause attacks in our spiritual storms in our life. Number three, the third reason for uh, storms and is that they bring spiritual alignment. I'm getting ready to go somewhere with this. So we are headed one direction in the wrong direction, but God allows some winds to come and blow us back in the right direction. The storms are a part of life. Sometimes they're a spiritual attack. Sometimes it's spiritual alignment. Did you know God will use some stuff in your life? 
to bring you back. Come on, y'all better act like you know what I'm talking about. Because some of you wouldn't call on God at all unless there was a storm hit your life. And then all of a sudden you get a storm, you, get, you start praying. Your prayer life gets good, your Bible study gets You even go to fasting if the storm is bad enough. Right? They bring us into spiritual alignment. And I want to submit to you, all storms, whether it's life or spiritual, always end up bringing us into alignment. But did you know there's a fourth reason for your storm? This is going to bless somebody. <laughs> it's going to bless somebody. In fact, if this blesses you, I need about 30 or 40 praisers. When, when I say this, when, when I say this, when, when, I, when I say this one, if there's some people in here that know what I'm talking about, that gets witness, I need three, 30 or 40 of you just to give God a praise, a crazy praise, like you've experienced this before. Can I give you the fourth reason for a storm? Sometimes God will send storms to help you get people off your boat. Y'all missed a good opportunity right there to praise God. Sometimes God will allow a storm to happen because you got some people that are on your boat that don't need to be traveling. Come on, some of you women have had Jonah on your boat. Throw him overboard. He's got to go. Some of you men have had Jonas on your boat. <laughs> Do you know God will allow storms to come to help you get people off your boat that don't need to be on your boat? Oh, I know it's good teaching. I feel the anointing right here, right now. Sometimes God will allow some storms to come to help you get Jonah off your boat. You say, but I don't have a boat. I know you don't have a boat, but some of y'all got Jonah in your iPhone. And I'm going to give you a word from the Lord. Swipe, delete. Come on, say it with me. Swipe. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to get Jonah out your iPhone right now. Come on, you just need, go ahead and do it. You can do it right now in my service. I won't get mad if you get your phone out. Just get your phone, look at it and say, mm-hmm, you a Jonah. I'm sorry, baby, but you got to go. Swipe. Some of y'all got Jonah in your Facebook Messenger. This is too fun. I love preaching when it's like this. Can I tell you what to do? Just scroll up a little bit, go down to the bottom, and there's a thing that says block. Listen to me. There are some people that are on your boat and the reason you're in the storm that you're in is because you're intent on keeping them on the boat. But you better listen to this prophet today. Until you get them off the boat, you won't get your breakthrough. I said until you get them off your boat, you won't get your breakthrough. Somebody shout, Jonah's got to go. Y'all act like a charismatic Pentecostal church on Sunday morning. Whew. So these storms that come into our life. So watch this. God prepares or gives Jonah a word. Jonah runs, so God prepares a wind. Well, <clears throat> the wind is happening. The storm is beating the boat to pieces, the Bible says. The people on the boat are throwing all the cargo off the boat. They're trying to figure out what in the world is causing this storm. I'm getting ready to bless somebody a second time. Can I tell you how to know who's got to go? I'm going to try again this side. This side over here is a little funny today. 
What about you, Balky? Can I tell you how you know who's got to go? How do you know when somebody got to be thrown off the boat? Can I tell you how to know who's got to go? Y'all ready for this? <laughs> this is so good right here. I might just take off running on this one. But, but I need about 20 or 30 praisers who are going to testify and witness to this right here. How do you know who's got to go? Well, whenever they went to find Jonah, Jonah was asleep while everybody else was struggling. Let me tell you how you know who's got to get off your boat. Anybody who can sleep while you're struggling, get them off the boat. Ah, yeah. Anybody who can be calm when you're under attack, get them off the boat. Anybody who can sleep while you're struggling, while you're fighting the devil, you better wake them up and get them off your boat. Somebody better give God praise right now. 30 seconds. In the, yeah. Listen, if I'm in trouble and I'm freaking out and you don't freak out, you got to go. You got to go. <laughs> if I'm freaking out, and you're not, you got to go. He said, record that. That's how you know who's got to get off your boat. I said, that's how you know who's got to get off your boat. Uh, does it not frustrate any of you guys when you're going through something and you got somebody in your life that don't think it's near as big a deal as you think it is? Can I give you a witness right now? Can I give you a word from the Lord? Go buy you some floaties at Walmart, put it on her arms, and throw them off your boat. <laughs> Tell them to go for a swim. <laughs> I almost preached with floaties on this morning, but I knew y'all put it on the internet. I'd be on Instagram. So watch. We've got the word. Jonah runs, so God prepares a wind. Now check this out. They finally, look, look at the scripture. The scripture says that Jonah says, hey, it's me. You got to get me off the boat. Notice what the scripture says. The scripture doesn't say he throws them off the boat. They throw them off the boat. The scripture says they went back to rowing. It's always hard to say goodbye to somebody that's got to go. It's always tough. It's always tough. It's always tough. But eventually, the storm gets bad enough, they grab Jonah and say, Bro, we love you and we're friends and all, uh, but I sure hope you got some good swimming lessons <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> and they chunk Jonah off the side. Whee! Oh. <laughs> now, when Jonah hits the water, the Bible says God prepared. There's that word again. Prepared a whale. So watch, we have the water, we have the wind, now we have the whale. God prepares the whale. Now, now if Jonah was writing this in the midst of his journey, what do you think Jonah would have been writing as he's laying on his back in the storm sees the boat slide off into the distance, and all of a sudden looks up, and here's a big fin swimming around him. <laughs> Somebody said, free Willie. That ain't even right. <laughs> Messed up my mess right What? <laughs> oh, y'all are crazy, but... <laughs> so... What, so, so what do you, what would you think? I can tell you what I would think. Have y'all ever been to Gulf Shores or Orange Beach, something, be in the water, and all of a sudden somebody yells shark? <laughs> Let me tell you what I do. I know I'm not all that spiritual, but this white boy can walk on water <laughs> when there's a shark. 
How many know you can jump on top of water, you run out of How many know you're a better swimmer when there's a shark? I don't see Jonah just laying back saying, okay, go ahead and eat me. I'm an hors d'oeuvre. No, I see Jonah riding. Ah! I don't know how you spell that. But, but look, what he saw is something that's, what is this? Was actually God's Uber. God called an Uber for Jonah, and it was a whale. Now, this would be a whale of a story, like most fishing stories, you know. It starts, you catch one like this, and by the time you tell the story, it ends up like this. This is God. God can't lie. God calls an Uber. I don't know. If like Dory, he started singing the whale song, I don't know. I don't know how he did. But did you know God can speak wellies? Huh? Yeah, it's not an Uber, it's a Woober. <laughs> that was a good one right there. <laughs> Y'all know God can speak wellies? Let, let, can, do we have it? Hit it for me. Get, get. All right, hang on, guys. Hang on, hang on. We got the wrong thing. That was uh, that was a recording of Pam sleeping last night. So that's all. Uh, you're preaching good when your wife is throwing water bottles at you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Woo, that's funny right there. I don't care who you are. That's funny right there. If that's not funny, just leave. I can't help you right there. Now, you know why that's important? Because whales are not indigenous to Tarshish area, which means God had to call a whale from a totally different region of the ocean. That whale wasn't just swimming out there by himself. God had prepared that whale because he knew that Jonah was going to be cast into the water and he wasn't going to let Jonah die without doing what he was called to do. So God prepared the whale. God prepared a whale. See, in Jonah's hopelessness, God sent provision. What Jonah saw as hopeless was actually God's provision. I'm going to say it one more time. What Jonah saw as hopeless was actually God's provision. Somebody in here needs to thank God right now for provision. So watch. Jonah's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Some commentators believe that he actually died. Who knows? The scripture doesn't say. It just kind of lends some direction. It kind of keeps it open-ended. But in the belly of the fish, in stomach acids of the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. Somewhere in the midst of what is this, I'm going to tell you how to get out of what is this over into provision. Can I teach you that? How do you get out of what is this into provision? If you go to chapter 2 and the last couple of verses, here's what it says. It says, And Jonah cried out from the belly of the fish and praised God. Very next verse. And God spoke to the whale. And the whale vomited Jonah up. 
So when you're in a situation where you don't know what to do and you say, what is this? The greatest response in a well of a situation is to begin to praise God for his provision. Even when you don't understand it. Come on, somebody. Praise God for his provision. Even when you don't feel like it. Praise God for his provision. When you get to the place you'll praise God even though you don't understand it, God speaks to the fish to vomit you up. So, look, we have the word, we have the wind, we have the well. Now, here's how I see it. The fish swims back to the, ocean, to the shore and spits Jonah up. Blah. Now, Here's how, I, you can read the story however you want when you preach it, but I'm preaching it. This is how I read it. I see this guy on the shore fishing. And about that time, here comes a whale. And he's going to fish like I'm fishing. He's going to start throwing it at him. Come on, how many of you fishermen never done that for bass, right? <laughs> trying to catch the whale. All of a sudden, the whale comes up and goes, blue. Spits Jonah up. Jonah has been in the belly of the whale for three days, three nights. The acid has bleached his skin. He looks like a zombie. His clothes are hanging off of him, gotten holes where the acid have just eaten his clothes almost off of him. He's got seaweed all over him. He stands up out of the sand, does this, picks some seaweed off and goes, Woo! What a ride! <laughs> now, if I'm the fisherman, I'm like running as fast as I can. Jonah finally goes to Nineveh. And in Nineveh, guess what Jonah does? He preaches. He prophesies, judgment is coming. You're all going to hell, you bunch of filthy sinner terrorists. You're all going to hell. He's expecting the judgment of God to be poured out on him. And all of a sudden, everybody starts offering sacrifices and repenting. And revival hits this great city to such a degree that the Scripture says every person in the city repents and even all the animals do. Cats get saved. Dogs get saved, canaries get saved, cows get saved, chickens get saved. Now you would think that right there at that point, Jonah would be taking Instagram photo, putting it all over social media, and calling Daystar TBN and saying, hey, come on over here, y'all have got to film this great revival. But that's not what happens. The Bible says Jonah gets depressed. It would be the equivalent of me having the greatest service day and everybody in our city getting saved in one service, David, and then all of a sudden, I go home and get depressed because everybody got saved. Jonah gets depressed. Watch this. Chapter 1, he's running from God. Chapter 2, he's running to God. Chapter 3, he's running for God. Or is he? Can I submit to you? He never really stopped running from God. He just got in trouble and ran to God. And while he was in trouble, he's trying to run for God. But as soon as his assignment was over, he reverted back to the same old self-absorbing spirit that he always had in the beginning. The reason I told you I wanted to subtitle this The Legendary Loser is because when you go to the final chapter and the final verses of this book, here's what you see. Jonah is under a plant. He's done gotten comfortable again. He's under this plant and he's moping. I knew if I come up here and preach that you're a good God and you're a merciful God and that people were going to get saved and turn their lives to you. I knew if that's what I did. And these are our enemies. What kind of prophet am I? What are they going to write about me in the history? I knew that's what was going to happen because I know you, God. And while he's sitting there, 
in the comfort of the shade of that tree, look at it, chapter 4 says, and God prepared. Say that with me. And God, watch, we have the word, we have the wind, we have the whale, but there's one more. God prepared a worm. We have the worm. And the scripture says this worm climbs up on the tree and eats it up. And as soon as the shade is eaten off, God prepares another wind. And it begins to beat on Jonah. And Jonah is mad. Can you imagine? Now, don't be too hard on Jonah. I want to submit to you, all of us do that. We get in trouble. We cry out to God. God saves us. God does a mighty work in us. And after a while, we forget what God's done. And we start acting like God's not even there anymore. And God don't care about us. And God doesn't love us. And we kind of go through that cycle over and over again. Well, this Jonah, Jonah has slipped back into this legendary loser mode. Le who's a her where he is just as self-absorbed as he always was. And God comes down to him and says, Jonah, why are you mad? Look at it. It's the last three or four verses in chapter 4. Look at it. Why are you mad? And then God says, Should, shouldn't I have pitied these people? And he basically says, listen, watch. This is where a lot of Christians are. He says, Jonah, you know what the problem is? You care more about plants than you do about people. Can I tell you what God did with the worm? I want to tell you something. Whenever you are comfortable, whenever you're comfortable in life, let me tell you what God does. God always prepares a worm to eat what you're comfortable setting under so that you can fulfill your calling. God will always prepare a worm to eat what you're comfortable setting under to help you get you to your calling. See, the whole book is about this. Jonah running. Jonah has a word. and Jonah is running from God, trying to run to God, trying to run for God, trying to run ahead of God. The problem is Jonah is running, but he's not changing. Help me, Lord. I said, the problem is Jonah is running, but he's not changing. I'm going to give you a word that's going to help you, and then I'm done today. As long as you run, you'll never change. But if you'll ever change, you'll stop running. I'm going to say it again. As long as you're running, you'll never change. But if you ever change, you'll be able to stop running. And there's some of you that are tired. You're like the running man. You're tired. You're worn out trying to run from God, trying to run to God, trying to run for God. Now you're running ahead of God. Listen, just quit running. The issue is not your running. The issue is you need to change who you are and your relationship with God. If you will change that, you won't have to run anymore. In every situation, no matter how much Jonah ran, God prepared something. And in the midst of the crisis, God kept saying to Jonah, I'm your provision. I don't care if it's a wind. I don't care if it's a whale. I don't care if it's a worm. I don't care if it's above the earth. I don't care if it's below the earth. I don't care if it's in the earth. Whatever the what is it, I'm your provision. But you got to lose the attitude that you care more about plants than you do about people. See, the real issue was Jonah's heart. Now, I told you never read a book till you complete it, right? You don't, you don't read a book when you write a chapter. You read a book after you get it all compiled. Never read a book till you complete it. And I tell you that. Notice how the book ends. Right there. Jonah the prophet's book stops right there. Just kind of leaves it out there hanging that Jonah was perpetually 
a legendary loser. Called, gifted, anointed, yet never did fulfill the real purpose of God for his life. I don't know about you guys, I don't want to be a legendary loser. Come on, I said I don't want to be a legendary loser. I know I might have missed it. I know that I've had some winds and storms in my life because I was headed in the wrong direction. I know God's had to prepare some whales for me, and God's even sent some worms for me. But one thing I don't want to do is get to the end of my book and the end of my life story just stopped right there. I don't want heaven to stop recording right there for me. I want it to go on to say, he repented, changed the way he thought, and became a great mighty man of God. Amen.